Okay, hey, welcome back, folks. Um, this uh, lecture will be week 5A, but as you've noticed in the Word document now setting out the readings, uh, this will be chapter 4. And this basic lecture in, in 5A and then followed up with 5B is a very important topic. A couple things before we begin. I got everything set up, and you don't notice out here to my left is I have a neighbor doing some renovation, so we may hear a little hammering. I hope it won't be too tedious. Uh, I'll re-record if, uh, if it gets to be a problem. But uh, you, as you can see on the uh, textbook PowerPoint, uh, the various learning objectives. Uh, you can just read through through those yourself. And uh, this is sort of a, one of those interesting chapters again where there's a potpourri of topics and uh, I wouldn't have organized it this way. Uh, w one of these days I am going to write my own textbook and I've organized it along the lines of the advanced lectures. But if you go to slide 4-7 uh, and we're going to discuss first of all a thing that came into the strategy literature in about the mid-90s and just took the field by storm and it's called resource-based theory. And I'm just going to read that first point. It contends that the possession of strategic resources, what I like to call a strategically valuable resource, provides an organization with a golden opportunity to develop competitive advantages over its rivals. And a, a strategic resource is strategically valuable if it passes uh, a couple tests. I'm going to give you one or two more tests in uh, Lecture 5B. It's the resource is valuable, it's rare, it's difficult to imitate, and it's non-substitutable. Uh, Remember that was one of our forces in the five forces industry analysis. The key I want to make to you is this, is a strategically valuable resource lies underneath the current particular products and services a firm is offering. And the, the best example uh, I can give you, uh, those of you not in Louisiana may not use uh, <coughs> hot sauce, but probably the, you know, to put on food, uh, to spice it up. The most recognized brand is Tabasco. And there in deep south Louisiana, you're driving along the very flat swamplands. And in the horizon, looks like, relatively speaking, looks like small mountains. And the McElhenney family moved into that property in the 1830s. And what those little small mountains are, are salt domes. As it turns out, those salt domes are the best place in the world to grow hot peppers. That is the McElhenney family's and Tabasco's strategically valuable resource. It lies underneath its variety of bottled hot sauces. It lies underneath its activities in the value chain, in their value chain, you know, from picking the peppers to crushing them to fermenting them for a year or two, their bottling operations, outbound logistics to their retailers and their department store channels. So that strategically valuable resource lies underneath its products and services. And the resource-based theory actually makes a very bold statement. It says that if a firm does not have a slate of strategically valuable resources, it's going to have a tough time competing and over time uh, runs the risk of falling into non-profitability uh, and perhaps even failure. It's quite a bold um, assertion to make. Uh, in slide 4.8, let's go on and, and sort of define some examples. You know, I, what I find good about this basic textbook is it's defining the, a lot of the terms and phrases in our field. And a sustained competitive advantage is a competitive advantage that will endure over time. Why? Because the firm has those strategically valuable resources that allows it to come out with a continual array of new products and services. So I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, think through uh, what the McElhenney family could do with those salt domes and its peppers. Well, right now they crush, ferment, turn into juice, but that might lead into a variety of other uh, uh, products and services 
down the line. Maybe uh, some kind of flavoring for industrial use, um, those kinds of things. So we've got two kinds of strategically valuable resources. One, the, the, the one we call tangible, and those that we can see. Uh, those are the physical assets, like the salt domes. Uh, any particular unique property, uh, a configuration of a manufacturing plant, uh, uh, equipment, etc. And what the resource-based theory has found through research is the m most valuable are actually intangible resources. Those are the resources that are difficult to see and touch uh, and quantify. And an example there could be uh, a very fundamentally unique research and development process. Uh, that could lead into a unique new product development process. An intangible resource could be a brand. Think of the Apple brand. And for those of us in Louisiana, the Tabasco brand is, is very, very well known and revered. There's t-shirts, head covers for golf clubs that have a sort of like their bottle and their trademarked, branded uh, look to their bottle. Uh, tangible resources we're finding can become to be commodities, but intangible resources have a very, very uh, long-lasting, enduring quality to them. Now, uh, again, uh, this is sort of splitting here. So if we go to slide 4.9, a capability is what an organization can do based on the resources it has. And the best example uh, I can think of is 3M. They, their, primarily strategic, their primary strategic resource is their knowledge around bonding stuff. So think of their very simple product called Post-it Notes. That's an adhesive that bonds. Well, that led them, that strategic resource of knowing how to bond, bond stuff, led them uh, uh, to... Uh, the dental industry, you know, um, dentures, bonding dentures, um, to uh, all kinds of things in industrial uses that require bonding. And a, a dynamic capability then is that unique capability uh, to continually update those capabilities and uh, I would add activities, remember from the value chain, I use activities and capabilities almost uh, synonymously, but uh, if we think of a capability uh, of going, in the case of 3M, of going from post-it notes bonding to dental bonding, those require different activities okay, in the value chain. So think of three major things we've discussed so far. A strategically valuable resource leads to capabilities that we can do based on the resource, then sort of migrate out, if you will, to different activities in different value chains to actually get the work done. And again, I think we can see very clearly that the activities in the value chain to produce a post-it note is very different than dental bonding. A distinctive competency is a set of activities in the value chain that an organization performs uh, especially well. And this is where, <laughs> this is chapter is a little bit of uh, a, a potpourri of kinds of things. All of a sudden they, they introduce the marketing mix, which uh, you uh, either have discussed if you've taken Marketing 701 or will discuss if you take Marketing 701. But I think if you go to slide 410, it makes sense of them introducing the four Ps in the context of, of Duff's. By the way, I was not familiar with them until I read the chapter, and they evidently produce very, very uh, upscale cakes. So, the, you know, the four Ps of marketing we'll discuss here in these slides on 410. Uh, it's product. Uh, evidently, their cakes are very, very unique. Uh, it's price. Wow, look at that on slide 411. Some of their cakes charge, or uh, they're, they're able to price of, of, of uh, $1,000 per cake. I'm not quite sure I would pay that, but uh, just like in Flower Country USA in week one, I was surprised that people would pay $250 to $350 for a single arrangement of flowers. 
Uh, the third uh, P of marketing is place, can be a physical purchase point, uh, as well as a distribution channel, as we can see in the picture on, on slide 12. Um, it's very unique because they have a converted church uh, that sells uh, its cakes. And finally then, promotion um, consists of communication used to market uh, uh, a product, and in this case, um, the, their popular presence on the Food Network um, has helped them uh, promote the name. So the question for this chapter uh, is, what kinds of strategically valuable resources and capabilities would lie underneath, perhaps, those four Ps around Duff's cakes? Well, I'm just surmising here. I haven't gone on the website and studied Duff's, but a tangible resource could be a secret family recipe for those cakes. Uh, could be a unique manufacturing process. Think about that. If we're uh, making, let's say, a thousand cakes at a time that we are charging a thousand dollars for, I think we would have a pretty unique manufacturing process uh, as a strategically valuable resource behind that product. An intangible resource could be its brand um, and even could be uh, its celebrity CEO. You remember we discussed that uh, several chapters ago. Those could be intangible strategically valuable resources. So I hope you see the relationship then among a strategically valuable resource, uh, the capabilities that allows us to do different things based on the resource, which then feed into the uh, key activities in the value chain uh, to actually get the product to the, the customer. So the next couple slides, starting on 14, uh, just define uh, firms' abilities to legally protect their strategically valuable resources. And you can read those for yourself. Uh, patents are probably the most strong legal form. Uh, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical companies rely on 25-year patents to protect its products based on its strategically valuable resources of making the, the, the legal drugs uh, that we take for whatever maladies. By the way, uh, some of you may know I went through a very serious back surgery, lost 17 pounds. So I'm, I'm getting to know all about the variety of pain medication uh, given that back surgery. Okay, uh, trademarks, again, are phrases, pictures, names, or symbols. Uh, we can see the familiar uh, McDonald's arches. Copyrights, uh, again, these are going from probably the strongest form of protection of that strategically valuable resource to the weakest form. Uh, copyrights, uh, uh, we, we try to invoke to protect, although uh, it's very difficult to up, actually uphold those in courts. I've had, in some of the work I've done over the years, I've had people just outright uh, steal my copyrights and, and uh, was unable to, to really do anything legal, legally to protect him. And finally, as a trade secret, again, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken supposedly has this trade secret for the um, crust that goes on their, on their fried chicken. So uh, again, starting with slide 18, uh, again, a review. I don't know why this is really in this chapter uh, discussing the value chain, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Again, remember we have primary activities and secondary or support activities going to, to slide 21. Does set us up for an interesting discussion of supply chain processes, and which is defined as a system of people, activities, information, and resources involved in creating a product or moving it to the customer. As the authors say, it's a broader concept than just the value chain and it captures the entire process of, of uh, securing or sourcing inputs the world over all the way to after sales service. But this sets us up for a discussion uh, of, of the concept of a best value supply chain. These have come to be critically important to companies in the developed world because of the very low cost position that we find in China. So earlier on, we gave the example in the linked activity set of Zara, fast fashion, you recall. 
they have a tremendously uh, tremendous integrated global supply chain that has all of the four uh, attributes that the authors suggest. It's very agile. It's, it's, uh, uh, its ability to act rapidly in response to, to dramatic changes in supply and demand. Think what would happen to McDonald's if its source of beef was disrupted. We would ha they would have to reconfigure that supply chain to perhaps use soybeans for a while until that supply chain of beef inputs uh, was corrected. I want to go back up to the definition at the top of slide 22. Uh, best value supply chain focuses on the total value added to the customer. So it's not just that we're trying to uh, lower those input prices, like the input of beef to McDonald's, but remember what total value added to the customer is a couple lectures ago. It's benefits minus burden. So we're trying to lower the cost on the input side while we're also trying to raise customer willingness to pay. Um, uh, uh, a, a, a best value supply chain is also very adaptable. So um, we, we need to reshape it uh, uh, when, when necessary. And that may, uh, in the case of this, the disruption of the beef supply to McDonald's, uh, sometimes we, we may uh, run out of supply and we may have to go to a different part of the world to source the inputs uh, that we have to service the demand that we're having for our product. And then alignment, um, creating consistency in the interest of all participants. And what, what they really mean there is, in years past, companies would try to beat their suppliers down on the price. And now the notion of alignment is firms want to try to give their suppliers a more favorable deal and really partner with suppliers for the long term. So, um, so supply chain management then creates competitive advantages and enhances firm performance uh, uh, by aligning against speed. We saw that in Zara fast fashion, very fast, they're agile, they're adaptive. Uh, adaptable and, and there's alignment throughout the supply chain. So uh, 23, slide 23 is just a, is a review. Uh, and then we close out this chapter with other views of firm performance. Uh, again, just uh, kind of let you know of some of the things that primarily academics are discussing right now, but uh, slide 24 has sort of op opposites. Enactment is a view of firm performance that says that an organization can, at least in part, create its own environment for itself uh, by putting strategies in place that reshape the competitive conditions in favorable ways. Uh, we looked at that uh, in terms of how companies respond to the five forces of industry structure. You remember we said that they, firms can try to reshape those structure, that structure to its benefit. The opposite is environmental determinism, which says that, just the opposite, that firms actually are very limited in their ability to, it, it really should be create their future, and they have adapt to the conditions around them, but the environmental determinism says that firms really have very little free choice or free will. They are locked into the determinants of the five forces of industry structure, let's say, uh, they're locked into channels, uh, etc. In reality, in practice, the world is both. Sometimes the world appears where there's a lot of free choice and free will, and sometimes the, the world looks like there's a lot of environmental determinism. A very quick example, um, 10 years ago I worked uh, with the top 44 officers at Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. I don't think I've given you this example yet. And at the beginning of the work together, there was too much supply, too much capacity of rail lines in the United States. There were uh, three or four dominant railroad carriers, and there was just not enough demand. So uh, Burlington Northern executives were 
And by the way, because of that then, they found their prices were being bid down. Well, in as little as 18 months, things completely changed, and it was called the China effect, where many, many firms were offshoring their manufacturing to China. China was exporting those back to the United States, and rail demand just skyrocketed. So literally in 18 months, their world went from uh, environmental determinism, they were stuck with an oversupply to exactly the opposite. They had an overage of demand that they could hardly fill. So in reality, we see the world bounce around uh, between those two poles. Slide 25, institutional theory uh, examines the extent which firms can copy each other, and we've referred to that before uh, as imitation. Transaction cost economics uh, centers on whether it's cheaper for a firm to make or buy it, it, the products that it needs. In other words, do we, do we do our own manufacturing or do we outsource manufacturing to somewhere else? Uh, in an earlier lecture, I think I had mentioned to you that Apple, surprisingly, does none of its own manufacturing. It outsources all of its manufacturing of all of its products to date uh, to China. And then backward integration theory we've seen occurs when a firm enters the business of one of its suppliers. So do we want to think about backward integrating uh, as we've discussed before? I think the example there I gave you was Mecklenburg Duncan when uh, we thought that we might backward integrate and acquire an aluminum company. Uh, aluminum was their biggest supply input to their manufacturing process. We decided wisely against that. But nonetheless, those are other views of firm performance. The chapter ends with a review of what we've discussed, and that is a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, and uh, uh, you recall from the, from the past lectures, we first do a PESTEL analysis that gives us a, a, an analysis of the general environment, and then we focus on the firm then to say, okay, against that pestle, what are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? And close the chapter in slide 27 by saying, uh, this is very much worth emphasizing here. The SWOT analysis is a very basic, age-old, tried-and-true tool in strategic planning. We want to leverage our strengths try to stay clear or resolve our weaknesses. We want to capitalize on, on our opportunities, and we want to try to protect ourselves against threats. So that would be the major th uh, takeaways coming out of a SWOT analysis. And you will want to do one of those for your uh, LEGO uh, case study. Okay, so that's it for chapter. Next up will be 5B and the more advanced uh, lecture based on the topic what is a strategically valuable resource. Thank you very much.